This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Unblack. Chapter 1, I suppose. Anarchism portends the, the promise of absence of authority or order. It is, it is intent on creating mayhem against those epistemological and metaphorical foundations that have so violently scripted black people and communities as a people without history, without knowledge, and without dream. End quote. H.L.T. Kwan, Emancipatory Social Inquiry, Democratic Anarchism and the Robesonian Method. William Godwin, Max Stirner, Mikhail Bakunin, Peter Kropotkin, Pierre Joseph Proudhon, Emma Goldman, and Erico Malatesta didn't really talk about blackness, were not really concerned with blackness, didn't bring blackness to bear on their thinking, and didn't think that blackness's specificity demanded attention. Not to mention that, save really for Goldman, anarchists didn't really think about the specificities of gender, let alone how gender circulates necessarily within capitalist and white supremacist formations, how race and class, that is, are constituated through and by gender. It was capitalism, it was capitalism, this government, that authority, individualism, rulers, the state, and on and on. But I am actually quite uninterested in the expected rhetorical move that Im- that implicitly garners one kind of validity, that that of pointing out racial and gendered allusions as the totality of one's argument. I will, however, do just that, but only for a moment, before more importantly speaking of blackness and its constitutive factors in this meditation, namely queerness and black feminism, on their own terms. But ah, the classics, the anarchist canon, as it were, has had its central tenets. Uh, If such an anti-authoritarian Uh, anti-authoritarian, non-doctrinal, intellectual praxis like anarchism can be said to have tenets, expressed by many of the aforementioned figures. To summarize, anarchism is the general critique of centralized, hierarchical, and thus oppressively coercive systems of power and authority. State power and capitalism are the culprits responsible for the horrors that surround us being deemed by anarchists as monopolistic and coercive, and hence illegitimate. The state, for instance, is inextricable from domination, Bakunin arguing that, quote, if there is a state, there must be domination of one class by another, end quote. In theory, anarchism is touted to oppose all kinds of oppression, be it racism, sexism, trans antagonism, classism, colonialism, ageism, etc., while there has been much less explicit meditation on the anarchist stance toward trans trans antagonism than, say, Capitalism, the coercive, dominative oppression is to be quashed. To be established instead is a society based on democratic, direct democratic collaboration, mutual aid, diversity, and equity, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. Though there are those who are more strict about incorporating those who precede the 19th century heyday of people beginning to explicitly call themselves and rally around a political movement called anarchism, I will not partake in such gatekeeping, for better, where a longer lineage of anarchist thought can be mobilized, or worse, where any form of dissent might be unjustifiably subsumed under anarchism, diluting its specificity and historical, historical situatedness. Like Kropotkin, one might understand the Epicureans and Cynics as anarchists since they avoided participation in the political sphere, retreated from governmental life, and advocated allegiance to no state or party. They lacked the desire to belong to either the governing or governed class. Kropotkin understands this as proto-anarchic, anti-state, and anti-authoritarian disposition. Far from meaning that everyone is left alone and unorganized, anarchism in the classical sense privileges democratic and communal relationality, obviating external rule and control. This is a positive conception of anarchism as voluntary 
participation predicated on each individual's autonomy and agreement with communal values. It bears nothing, though, that an anarchist society may take different forms. Socialist anarchism, which emphasizes developing communal groups that are intended to thrive in the absence of hierarchies and a centralized governmental structure, or individualist anarchism, some of which reject any and all group identities, communal mores of the good, and venerate individual autonomy. Max Stirner represented perhaps the furthest pole of this tendency with his refusal to obey any law or any state, even if it was collectively arrived at. The self is the only arbiter of one's own life. As well, there is anarcho-syndicalism, which supports workers in a capitalist society gaining control over parts of the economy and emphasizes solidarity, direct participation, and the self-management of workers. Additionally, anarcho-syndicalism has the aim of abolishing the wage system, seeing it as inextricable, inextricable from wage slavery. Life under anar Life under non-anarchist rule conceives of the political arena as a good that exists to protect and serve the people, or better, a system chosen by the people. So much of ancient Greek philosophies, modern liberal philosophies, and political philosophies assert in various ways that obedience to the law is a prima facie duty and, and an inarguable good. Anarchism called this very foundation into question. What arises in the hopeful disintegration of rule by an authoritarian nation state is a society that cares for one another communally and democratically without the need for a tyrannical force of coercion or sovereignty. Anarchists like Godwin and Proudhon and Bakunin based this anarchist society on beliefs in reason, universal moral law, education, and conscience. With this very brief overview, the task set forth here is slightly different. It parallels yet departs from, as well as stands in contrast to, this anarchist history, an anarchic shadow history, if you will, a para-anarchism that anarchizes anarchism. What is not being done here is an attempt to find heads or figures of black anarchism to give clout to as <laughs> clout to it as a wing of anarchism as a whole. While I will surely cite throughout this chapter as well as subsequently in other chapters, the thought of people like Lucy Parsons, the Black Rose Anarchist Federation, Lorenzo Kumba Irvin, and Zoe Samudzi. This project is in fact not concerned with simply trotting out a list of anarchist of black people as the meaning of black anarchism. I am articulating an anarcho-blackness first and foremost as an inhabitable modality of anarchic subjectivity and engagement. This may lead to a discernible black anarchism. Fine, but the aim is not to arrive at black anarchism. It is, rather, to engage in anarcho-blackness that moves toward what might be called a black anarchism. There are a number of racialized, gendered, and radicalized gendered elisions present in classical anarchist theorizations that demand being pointed out. Bakunin, quote, if there is a state, there must be a domination of one class over another. As a result, Slavery. The state without slavery is unthinkable, and this is why there are enemies of the state. End quote. Overlooked here is how the history of enslavement of peoples of color, specifically black people in the Western world, is the haunting specter of his claim. The condition of the slave, which is, one, which is on one plane, the condition of blackness, is the relationship between a people to the state. Thus, anarchism in its anti-statism, must reckon full force with blackness as blackness serves as the distinct angle of vision for encountering the effects of state sanctioned enslavement and oppression. To abolish slavery necessitates the liberation of blackness, making anarchism an emancipatory project, a project that has its foundation a grappling with blackness. On the topic of the state, there has also been the tendency to collapse the relative effects of violence. That is, if it is indeed true that the state bears a hostile relationship to those it controls, there are some who are controlled in different ways and who feel the force of the state in more acute ways. To rest at the nexus of black 
and trans, for example, is to feel the brunt of the state in scrutinizing gender binaristic and racializing ways, which give one over to the likelihood of poor housing conditions, lack of job access, increased rates of incarceration, which then subjects one to the gendered carceriality of prisons and its pervasive misgendering violence and the like. Examine the lives of Miss Major, Marsha P. Johnson, C.C. McDonald, Anarchic meditation on the terrors of the state begin in the right direction, but they fall short of taking the critique as deeply as it demands. A critique of the state is in order too, though. A traditional focus on the state as the end-all be-all of oppression must be the thought of as more than simply a governmental agency or a bastion up high doling out sentences and decrees. The state is to a relation, a way of dictating how people are to be interacted with. We encounter one another on the logics of intelligibility that the state demands and that structures how one can appear to others, circumscribing subjective parts and desires that fall outside of this framework. And this is a violence. We must also note how this relation is not only in the public sphere, but characterizes any sphere in which interaction is had. Furthermore, these relations are textured by racial and gendered hierarchies. One relates to others on their presumed gender, their presumed race, and disallows them to be otherwise than this fundamentally externally exposed subjectivity. The other has had no opportunity to announce themselves to us on non-state grounds. Any anarchism, then, must recognize this and commit to dismantling their hierarchies within relationality and move towards the disorderly, disruptive refusal to continue living by state laws. So if anarchism truly does represent, quote, to the unthinking what the proverbial bad man does to the child, a black monster bent on swallowing everything, end quote, then we must recognize that the blackness of the black monster is no accident. It is in fact constitutive. To infuse anarchism with anarcho-blackness is to push anarchism's logics further. Many anarchists do not organize on the grounds of difference or differentiation, even as they sought ways to prevent their silencing. Hence, anarcho-blackness sup supplements these oversights via an insistence on perhaps assemblage or swarm or ensemble, whereby there is a consensus or consent not to be individuated, which is another way to say an affirmation to emanate from difference toward the insistence on collectivity and agential singularity. It is not unanimous we seek to be, it is ensemblistic, assemblic, a distinction that manifests in the proliferation of life for those who might queerly imagine or emerge when conditions are saturated with the elimination of institutions that curtail such life. Saidia Hartman writes in The Terrible Beauty of the Slum, quote, better the fields and the shotgun houses and the dusty towns and the intermittable cycle of credit and debt, better this than black anarchy, unquote. These zones of non-being, Hartman says, purloying France for non, are the regulated domains of black peoples, or more precisely of those who inhabit the rebellious posture of anarcho-blackness. They are attempts to corral what Hartman calls black anarchy, or what William C. Anderson and Zoe Somozzi call the anarchism of blackness. This is Anarcho-blackness, the primordial mutiny to which regulation responds, it concerns what Michael Hart, reading Foucault's reading of Marx, calls a priority of the resistance to power. If Marx understood dominative disciplining in the workplace as a response to worker insurgency, and if we understand the era of U.S. enslavement as a response to the anti-captivity expressed through blackness, and further, if we understand capitalism's constitutive racial differentiation and reproduction of reproductive and disposal humanity rooted in the commodification of black and subjects, then anarcho-blackness comes in to describe the anarchic insurgency that defines the abolition of the state and hierarchization. hierarchization. 
This is about what blackness does to and through anarchism, not against it. We need anarchism's musings and movement strategies so it would be antithetical to radical world transformation to jettison anarchism's gifts. Two, though, anarchism cannot simply do what it has always done, which is itself multifarious an enterprise, as such has been predicated on, in part, an illusion of the weight of white and cis male supremacy. That is, we cannot just add in racial and gendered perspectives to an already functioning anarchism. We cannot also simply throw out anarchism on the grounds of these illusions. The task is to mobilize the effects of black feminism and anarchism colliding in harmonious, complex chaos. This mobilization is what I've deemed anarcho-blackness and anarchaos, to borrow a beautifully apt lexicon from Christopher R. Williams and Bruce A. Arrigo. It should be clear that the racial and gendered illusions of classical anarchism demand critique. The deceptive absence of black anarchist politics in the existing literature writes Black Anarchist Rose Federation, can be attributed to the inherent contradiction found within the Eurocentric canon of classical anarchism, which, in its allegiance to a Western conception of universalism, overlooks and actively mutes the contributions by colonized peoples, namely Black peoples. But Black anarchism does not begin and end at that critique. What might a black anarchism look like to itself, not simply a reactionary posture toward the implicit whiteness in classical anarchism? Blackness enters anarchism, and anarchism enters blackness as an enabling ethics of precedence. That is, it is and was important that, quote, it is not just European people who can function in an anti-authoritarian way, but that we can, but we all can, end quote. But what is more apropos to anarcho-blackness's concerns is how blackness and those in proximity to its work and histories operate anarchically. On one register, black communities themselves are, one might say, anarchist communities. They don't involve the state, the police, or the politicians. We look out for each other. We care for each other's kids. We go to the store for each other. We find ways to protect our communities. More expressive of the anarcho, however, is dissolving the homogeneity often imposed onto blackness. Ashanti Alston articulates his black anarchism in a way that allows for blackness not to be reduced to a monolith. Alston remarks, quote, I think of being black not so much as an ethnic category, but as an oppositional force or touchstone for looking at situations differently. Concluding, so when I think when I speak of a black anarchism, it is not so tied to the color of my skin, but to who I am as a person, as someone who can resist, who can see differently when I am stuck and thus live differently. End quote. The blackness here marks a non homogenous descriptor of subjectivity. Said subjectivity, however, is not so much skin color as Austin notes. Blackness does not merely consolidate all those who meet a racial quantum, such a measure would collapse and monolithize those under its rubric. What Alston advances is not blackness as a as people who are black. He advances in anarcho-blackness, a conceptualization of blackness as tied to a politically and radically penchant for so- sociality and social arrangement. The blackness open to whoever is committed to expressing the liberatory politics it calls for. Of course, the Anarchist movement is overwhelmingly white, as Lorenzo Camoa Irvin notes in Anarchism and the Black Revolution. What else is new? I am grateful to Irvin for making this plain, but it is not a substantive argument around which to build a political thought and movement. What does black anarchism do in excess of reacting to white people? This is my concern, and I maintain that black anarchism troubles the ground on which we stand, taps into mutinous force that behaves in subversion and regulation, and attempts 
and attends to how people may be different, differently positioned or differently positioned themselves. Developing spaces for new revolutionaries is one of the various iterations of anarchisms as establishing a political home that in my reading, the Black Rose Anarchist Federation sees as a different society in which everyone can live. It is not a parochial endeavor as it focuses as if focus on blackness ever was. It is not particular to a specific demographic, though it is unapologetic in its focus on a particular demographic. Blackness as anarchy provides a glimpse into another kind of world by heeding the abundant trove of epistemological richness that can be found in this synecdoche for blackness, the Negro. To C. W. E. Bigsby, the Negro is, quote, a convenient image of the dark, spontaneous, and anarchic dimension of human life, who has anarchic impulses, and this has metaphysical as well as pragmatic implications, end quote. The implications are vast. Blackness possesses a grounding anarchic impulse, an impulse to move without permission and live without rule. Human life flourishes in this. It thrives in this terrain. So to speak of anarchism, one must speak of these dark impulses. One must speak of blackness. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.